is that the lower court erred in determining that a referendum uh, was needed uh, in, in the aftermath of the adoption of ordinance 0801, which addressed short term rentals. Um, and so, in this case, the, the town believes that the lower court didn't give really a due analysis enough to if the code as it existed prior to ordinance 0801. Because since 1946, did the original code preclude any rentals? Yes, I'll just talk about through that. You know, if I could. Um, it, it did. It's a town position that it did preclude rentals. So, the point is that I'm sorry. Point us to the language. Uh, I am. So, so um, the code that existed prior to the adoption of 0801 first said all uses must be permitted uses. So, the town of Rainton Beach, very small town, it's, it's Virtually all residential. But the but the preface to that is single family residential purposes and that uses of their homes must be permitted uses. Single family residential purposes is not so limited as not to include short term rentals, is it? It, it is in this case. And, and, and well, 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 wait, wait, let's go back to my question. Does it preclude all rentals? It precludes renting short term. No, that's not what I asked you. I asked you, does, did the zoning as written preclude rental of the pro of any property, period? No. If, okay, if, so a single uh, resident, single use residence could be rented out on an annual basis. Yes, sir. So what language, now to go to Judge Morris's question, what language precludes that specific type of rental. If you've acknowledged rentals were allowed, what precludes short-term rentals? So, so again, the, the course have made clear for, for many decades, you have to look at a body of law in whole, in whole to understand what the meaning of, of a code is. And, and this was written in 1946, vacation rental wasn't a thing then. But, but if you look at District 3, it's very instructive. In, in the district, this was prior to, to the ordinance, District 3 says, um, with the exception of Lot 9, Block 6, which was zoned for operation of rental cottages or units in buildings as now constructed only since that lot was, at the time the zoning code was created, being actually used for a use non-conforming with single-family residential only. That's a quote. And so what that means is that the, the town fathers at that time said, in their mind, the, the, there's a lot here, uh, um, lot nine, that, that had on it rental cottages, short-term rental cottages where people would come and take vacations. They, they made it, they carved out an exception for that because that was a, a non-conforming use when they adopted the new That was for District 3? Yeah, they, that is for District 3. Two? I, I understand, Your Honor, but, but I'm talking about using the, the terms that they used back then. Well, so, so, in order to come to the conclusion that you're trying to get to, you have to go beyond the plain meaning of the words, right? You have no. You have to understand what the plain meanings of the words are. The, not a read of the plain meaning of the words. Nowhere in there does it say short-term rentals are prohibited. I would argue to you, Your Honor, that in, in any zoning code written in the 1940s, short-term rental was not a I, I understand that. But if I am a textualist, I am going to look at the words, and I want to see, do these words say, I cannot you, you know, use my property as a short-term rental? And there's nothing I can read in the language of this code that, that, would, that would tell me that. I submit respectfully to the court, Your Honor, that, that as to the District 3 language talking about Lot 9, Lot 6, that where they state uh, that short term renting of the cottages and the units were non conforming with what they call single family residential use. Well, but, but then you're ignoring the opening provision of that little subsection, which talks about. Allowing zoning for a real estate brokerage office, an office for rental and operation of rental cottages or units. So that doesn't seem to me to modify single, the use for single family dwelling houses. It's creating something different that there can be a business use for this purpose in zone. In it, wasn't, it wasn't creating anything. 
That was what was there. For there was, there was a little three. rental office, and then there were the company for District Three. Yes, okay. and, and there was no company. need to. There was no need to talk about rental restrictions in District Two because you didn't have a rental office or however it was described, a uh, real estate brokerage office, an office for rental and operational rental. No, so no. Zone Two didn't discuss it. District Two did not have to discuss it in any way. But what District 2 and District 3 share in common is that they are both saying you're limited with the exception of District 3's carved out for Lot 9. So what you said at the beginning, as far as a restriction uh, being implicit or being explicit as to short-term rentals, you acknowledge that in District 2, you could have rentals of a year. That's correct. There was nothing in the code that precluded long-term rentals. And in terms of District 3, where does it say short-term rentals are allowed? In District 3, where does it say short-term rentals? You're telling us that we need to refer to District 3 to understand District 2's language. And you're focusing on the fact that it was zoned for use as a real estate brokerage and office for rental and so forth. So what in District 3 draws a distinction between long-term and short-term rentals that you're now trying to impose on District 2. Because it would have made no sense for the, for the founders who wrote the code in 1946 to call out that. Wouldn't your argument be better if you said that District 2 allowed no rentals, not it allowed long-term rentals, but no short-term rentals? Because District 3 doesn't address short-term rentals. Your Honor, I, I understand your argument. I, well, I understand your argument, but I'm having some difficulty in your reliance on District 3's language, which doesn't seem to talk about short-term rentals. I'm trying to talk about all of the language taken as a whole, and, and, and if I could move to District 1, because I think that's also informative of what was in the, 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 the head of the drafters of the code in the 1940s. In District 1, the regulations there expressly said transient accommodation uses were allowed in District 1, but limited to 15 units per acre. Now, in terms of what in modern world we think of as vacation rentals or short-term rentals, transient accommodation uses is the closest word. So that. would it your argument be that District 1 and District 1 and District 3 allow rentals, but District 2 would allow no rentals? I don't know how, you, how you, I'm, I'm really puzzled by that. How do you get to rentals are okay in District 2, even though District 2 doesn't talk in any way about rentals, short-term, long-term rate, but you're saying, well, long-term rentals are okay because District 1 and District 3 have that language, some sort of language there. And, and the, but the point is that District 2 and District 3 both call out, this code wasn't written and maybe it should have been back then, but it wasn't. It wasn't written to be in the, the proscriptive, to say you are not allowed to do A, B, C, D, and E. It, it, it instead said, which I began with, all uses must be permitted uses. We will express to you what the permitted uses are. So a short-term rental as a single uh, family home seems to be, well, let me take out the short-term rental part. Use as a single family home is permitted in zone two. Correct. And, 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 and in the 1920s, and 1930s, and 1940s. And in the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, and 1950s, it as it is today, it's very common in the entire country that some people buy the house because they can afford down payment and so forth. And some people rent houses in which to live with their single families. And at for, that time, it was for longer terms. It, correct. It, it, that's so the they use change the development of short term is a change from what existed back in those days. Well, except there was a thing that existed back then, which still exists now called transient accommodation uses. And, and that is in the mind of, of the founding fathers when they wrote that in District 1. They're making the distinction. We have people, we have families that are living here in these single family homes. But then we have District 1 over here, which we acknowledge there will be transient members. There'll be people coming and going. That is also what occurred on Lot 9, Block 6, and District 3, where those rental cottages then existed at the time, and people came and people went. 
So I regret that they did not, back in the 1940s, uh, use more expressive language, but I believe that that person of average intelligence would be able to understand that. The, uh, I don't think a lawyer would have understood that you couldn't have a short term rental in District 2 if they bought a house there. I mean, the interpretation that you're trying to explain to us is a long and winding road. I, I don't think a skilled lawyer, a land use lawyer, would be on notice that you couldn't do that if they were buying a piece of property in your town. That's the problem with your argument. I mean, this code gives no one any notice. As a matter of fact, what are we to make of the fact that your predecessor, or the previous town attorney, um, told um, basically the buyer that, um, that the ordinance was unenforceable in terms of this short-term rental. Um, the, 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 the opinion of a prior town attorney is not relevant to this case. Anymore. Well, it is relevant. It's totally relevant to your opponent's estoppel claim. It, I, 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 I want to speak to, to that. The town understands, and I understand, that the outcome of this case, any any owner, any current owner, any prior owner who's passed on title, who has obtained a declaratory judgment or whatever in, in the several cases that were put into the record, those rights of those people are not undermined by the outcome of this case. The town is concerned about all the other properties out there. Well, the way your, your opponent, let's talk about how your opponent has pled this, right? You sought a declaration that the ordinance is valid, not preempted, and that any challenge based on invalidity for the lack of referendum is time barred. And your opponent has set up the claim that within the, the predecessor to the LLC was told that the ordinance wouldn't be enforced as long as a risk that it would be declared invalid. And they relied on that and converted the property to a rental. Then after the requisite time passes, the statute is running, gotcha. So where we stand procedurally right now is, is this was a motion for judgment on the pleadings asking the court to rule upon the issue of the referendum requirement. If the, if the court wanted to rule on the other issues that were raised- Well, that was a defense uh, and this is judgment on the pleadings. That's correct. And, and, and so the judge erred, the lower court erred in finding that a referendum was required. If a referendum would be allowed, the, all of their claims that they raised below, if reversal occurs, will still exist and the lower court will have to deal with those. But what I'm trying to, to convey is that the lower court cut off all of that discussion by running to I find that a referendum should have occurred, and I find that the ordinance is null and void. And because I'm probably running out of time, I wanted to talk about the second issue um, here, which is, is the, the nullification of the ordinance. So the, the, the court found, and, and it, not to be critical of the lower court because other judges do do it, um, but, but the, the court in this case heard our arguments and then asked us to submit competing orders and sign the order submitted by my opponent. So effectively, my opponent wrote the nullification language. There was no legal analysis of that. Wait, you're not making a verbatim order argument here, are you? Pardon? You're not making a verbatim order argument here now, are you? What I'm arguing is that is that the my opponent wrote the order and that for better or for worse, the trial court didn't chose to accept that as, as per order. Well, let, let me refer you to your complaint. In paragraph 30, you say that there's a bona fide actual present and practical need for this declaration as counties to determine whether the ordinance is valid and enforceable. As the right. court ruled and made the declaration and determined it is not valid and enforceable. How is that inconsistent with what you were asking the court to do? No, the language the court used is that the ordinance is null and void. And that has the Supreme Because court. it's not valid, it's not enforceable. That, but that suit, that, that builds in an answer to so the question. Is it your argument that if it is invalid and unenforceable, that it's not void? Those are two different. No, that's, that, that's what I'm asking. Is that your position? That it is still a valid 
uh, ordinance. It absolutely and you're is. Into your it was doing. Time, just so you know. I'm sorry. You're into your rebuttal time, but you can use your time any way you want. Thank but, you. But, but don't go back to issue one because I, I understand not, your argument on issue one. I'm not. I'm trying to deal with the issue of voiding. And what I'm saying to you, Your Honor, is that the ordinance was duly adopted in 2008. There has been no contention by the other side that it wasn't. And, and this court and the court of Supreme Court has ruled that a void ordinance is an ordinance adopted without proper notice or legislative authority or in excess of police powers. Ordinance 2008 was properly adopted and it currently sits on the books. The so only you issue- would be satisfied if the judge would have said it's invalid and unenforceable. I would have been satisfied if the judge, if she was going to find that a referendum was required, I would have been satisfied if the judge would have said, Mr. Eschenfelder, I'm reading the charter provision, and the charter provision seems to say that you should have done a referendum. Go have a referendum, which is what we have done. I have a pending motion for you all to, to recognize. So it would have been improper for the court to say the ordinance is invalid and unenforceable as part of the declaratory judgment action? By nullifying it, then by... No, I just want to make sure I understood. There's nothing to have a referendum on. And our position is, until the court tells us otherwise. Well, there is something to have a referendum on. If you want to eliminate short-term rentals, you're, then you would have a referendum on the ordinance. You're well under your rebuttal time, but again, it's your time. I'm just trying to help you out. You'll have three minutes when you come back. Good morning. I'm Marion Hale. I represent Big Beach House. May it please the court. Ms. Hale, can I ask you a question right off the bat? Because it was just raised a second ago about the referendum that was had post judgment. Yes. And there's a motion that we take judicial notice of that. Now, what the citizens, voters, what they say is very important. And I don't mean to in any way trivialize it by what I'm about to say, but is that in any way relevant to what we're doing here today? No, it's not. It wasn't before the trial court. And what you were doing today. <laughs> is you are reviewing what the trial court did. I mean, we we would like to be popular. You know, we're sensitive people. We would like to do what the people want. But as judges, we're not allowed to do that, are we? Not in this case, I mean, I mean, the moment we start seeking to be popular, we depart from our judicial role, don't we? You'll not only depart from your judicial role, you will never end up being popular because 50% of the people at any time will not like what you do. That's true. So, so it's a successful case when everybody's unhappy. Yes, <laughs> correct. The trial court could not consider the referendum. The referendum had not occurred at the time the trial court ruled. And all you do is you review what the trial court did. And for that reason, and that reason alone, you can't consider the referendum. Um, the town asked in its motion for a judgment on the pleadings, a quote, respectfully request this court enter an order declaring the validity of the town's code. That's exactly what the trial court did. And the trial court ruled that the court, that the ordinance was invalid and unenforceable, correct quote, and null and void. And of course it was null and void for the lack of a referendum. They can't complain about what they asked for. If you ask for declaratory relief, you are saying that there is a dispute and you are asking for an interpretation of an ordinance or statute or contract. That's the purpose of chapter 86. And that's what they did. You got to be careful what you ask for in this world because sometimes you get it. And they asked for whether this was enforceable and whether it was valid. And the court found it wasn't. And it wasn't for exactly the reason that you're focusing on in your questions, because they did not have a referendum and they did not have at any ordinance, a person of average or above average intelligence would ever have interpreted as preventing short-term rentals in district two. They had two circuit court decisions, the Hinton case and the Elliott case, both of which found that short-term rentals had not been barred in Reddington uh, Beach prior to the enactment of the 08 ordinance. The town did not appeal either one of those, and they have not argued to you that the two circuit court judges in Pinellas County were wrong in deciding the Hinton case or the Elliott case. 
And if they believe those decisions were wrong, why didn't they appeal them? But they didn't. Ms. Hale, may I shift your focus a little sure. bit, please? We talked with your opponent a little bit about the estoppel argument, which, as I understand it, is predicated on what the town's representative said to Mr. Kib Kibben, the predecessor. Mr. McKibben. Mr. McKibben. Yes. Uh, Mr. McKibben's wife is the managing member of Big Beach House. So you're, I think you sense where I'm going with this. For purposes of applying, uh, using your estoppel argument here and applying it, we, you have one party that's accepting the representation, Mr. McKibben, in 20, sometime between 2013 and 2017, and builds the property, renovates the property to make it a, a rental. But you're using the LLC, which is a different entity, different party, and bridge that gap for me on the reliance piece of your estoppel argument. Do, am I making myself clear? You are, but I'm not sure that it matters for this appeal because the trial court did not get to our counterclaim, which is where the, pro the promissory estoppel is. But had it reached that, um, it is that our client, Mr. McKibben, his representative, who was Mr. Savar, a lawyer in Tampa, uh, had discussions with uh, Mr. Dano, who is the current uh, city attorney or the town attorney. And Mr. Dano had the conversation with him after the city reached a uh, settlement in the best case, which is a case that we handled Mr. McKibben's next door neighbor. Mr. McKibben was extremely anti short term rental. And then he was very upset that the town had settled with Mr. Bess. And Mr. Bess had <clears throat> gotten the city to agree that he could continue short term rental. And he was very upset and he let Mr. Dano, the town attorney, know how upset he was. And Mr. Dano told his lawyer, Mr. Sabar, well, not to worry about it because you might as well throw in the towel. You might as well short term rent. We're not going to enforce it. We're concerned someone will challenge it. <clears throat> Mr. McKibben then through Big Beach House, which he creates to do the short term rentals. He then uh, spends the money to rehab the house to do the short-term rentals. And therefore, um, Big Beach House is the successor in interest to Mr. McKibben, if that answers your question. I, the only follow-up that I have on that is I understand the difference between your affirmative relief, the affirmative relief that was requested and the counterclaim, and we're not troubled by that today. Um, and the, the trial court basically bypassed the affirmative defenses on the finding that a referendum was required. Right. But if we were looking at various bases for affirmance, the estoppel argument would come into play because your affirmative defense, your first affirmative defense, does include the allegations concerning what was told to the predecessor. And that is why I'm asking you that, that question. Yes, thank you. And, you're, and I, to make sure I understand your response, it is, it doesn't really matter because it was all in the family through the McKibbins to the Big Beach House. And they created Big, Big, Big Beach House merely to handle the rentals because they didn't want it in their own name because the, the property had been in Mr. McKibbins' name and for personal liability reasons wanted to create an LLC. Understood. I, it was, it's just the... the change in the identity of the party that Correct. I was wanting to have you address. Thank you. Right. So I don't think there's any doubt that there was no prohibition on short-term rentals in District 2. There are the two cases out there, they did not appeal. Uh, they attached those two cases to their complaint. So that becomes part of the pleadings and they are contrary to the allegations in the complaint, although they actually mentioned them in the complaint. Um, and the other case I wanted to mention was the All Britain versus City of Solar <coughs> case uh, decided by Judge Kuzan when she uh, was a trial court judge. And she rejected the exact argument that Reddington Beach is making in this case, which is the notion that if you have zoning for residential use, that is a ban on short term renting. And Clearwater, City of Clearwater, raised that argument in the All Britain case. And Judge Kazam read, uh, 
wrote a very lengthy decision in that case in which she rejected that and said chapter 166 requires if you are having prohibited uses in a zoning district you must have notice to the public and an opportunity for a, a, a hearing and you must have a ordinance which a person of average intelligence can understand. Uh, one thing I'd like to clear up, Mr. Eschenfelder claims that we wrote this decision for Judge Muscarella. That is untrue. Both parties were asked to submit uh, proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law. We both did. Uh, this is not the one that we sent to the court. Uh, she may have used some uh, information from ours, but she did not sign the one that was well, signed. we've got a transcript of the hearing where the arguments were presented and yes. certainly our paper record. Right. I mean, that issue is not really in play here anyway. I wouldn't think so, no. <clears throat> I don't think so. Um, on the question of whether this ordinance amends or clarifies the code, I think that is uh, a bogus argument. The complaint itself in paragraph 11 alleges that the 2008 ordinance amends the code. So the pleadings, this is a motion for judgment on the pleadings and the pleadings themselves allege that the 2008 um, uh, code, uh, I'm sorry, uh, ordinance does amend the zoning code. And we know based on the charter, if you amend the zoning code, it has to go to the referendum. So I think all of those issues are, are basically what's going on here is the town did not obey its own laws and its own rules. And it wants the trial court and it wants this court to excuse it from actually having to obey its own rules and regulations. It didn't do so. It waited 14 years to have a referendum. And now it finds itself in a very awkward position of not having a viable short-term rental ordinance. It wish it had one. It says in its reply brief, the town wants its ordinance back. I don't believe that there is a way legally to give the town its ordinance back. It put itself in this position. It put itself in its, this position by not obeying the own requirements in its own charter. So we would ask you to affirm the decision Judge Muscarello. Thank you. Thank you. You have three minutes, sir. Thank you, Your Honors. First, the zoning, the, the charter does not say if you amend the zoning code, it must go to the referendum. It is much, there is much long, uh, more detailed language. So if, section 20 of the charter doesn't say that? Your Honor, it says if you amend the zoning code in a way which restricts, provides, or establishes zones or zoning, then that goes to the voters. Not every amendment to the zoning code goes to the voters. And your position is that this didn't do Because it. it's a mere clarification, it didn't trigger it. And, and the prior town attorney in 2008 rendered an opinion that to the then mayor that said, and it's in the record, you don't have to do your referendum because this is just clarifying what everybody believed the code said before 2000. This is the same person that was telling people not. No, no, this this is a completely different model. And is this before or after the, uh, well, I guess it would be before the two circuit court opinions, right? Correct. And 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 so um, we're not asking you, the town's not asking you to be popular. Please understand, I, I totally understand the role of this court. What the town is asking is So that, why then do you want us to, to, to take judicial notice of the referendum? Judicial efficiency, because what would happen is, uh, my position is that Ordinance 0801 was duly adopted. It should never have been nullified and declared void because that is not a legal remedy. The only issue is, should a referendum have occurred? If, if, if the lower court says a referendum should have occurred, the town needs to have the right to have that referendum. It already occurred, and so I'm trying to simply, my attempt to get judicial, rec judicial recognition of it is for judicial efficiency, because otherwise on remand, we will then go back and say, Judge Muscarella, we have now had the referendum. My opponent will then argue, well, that doesn't matter because the, the uh, statute that came into place in 2011 nullifies it. So that's a separate legal argument that was not before the lower court. That's why I have attempted to put it before this court. But if this court doesn't judicially recognize it, then under the record that exists, you had a nullification of a duly adopted ordinance from the duly elected members of the commission. 
thinking to themselves in 2008, we don't have to, to do this. My opponent says that we aren't following the law. suggesting that the newer referendum somehow relates back, are you? Well, Your Honor, I, I, I hope I'm, that's I'm, say, I'm just puzzled by, by what you just said, but it's neither here nor there because ultimately we're going to decide the cases before us based on the facts that the trial court had before it. Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. I, I just, I, there is no law that says when that referendum needed to occur. So the relation back argument, if this court didn't parse it and only it puts it,